Um, I am excited about doing a little bit of a series this weekend in a way that I don't know that I've done in a while, especially in somebody else's place. I want to work on the Ark of the Covenant for a few services. I want to start tonight by working on it, and then I want to kind of progress into um, wherever we end up tonight. We'll just move right on into tomorrow night. Wherever we end up tomorrow night, we'll move right into Sunday. Uh, not because I'm trying to drag it out into three services, but because there's a lot to say about the ark if we're really paying attention to the scriptures. And, and so I just want to work it a little bit from the New Testament point of view and tell some Old Testament stories and try to give us an understanding about something that, quite frankly, um, if we didn't have a record of it in the Bible, wouldn't really mean much to our Christianity because we don't rebuild arks of covenants in our churches. You know, we don't put up little pictures of the ark and feel like it's, uh, we don't do with it what we do with the cross, okay? We hang the cross in our churches as a representation of Christ dying on Calvary. We hang the cross as a representation of our dying at Calvary. We have pictures of the empty tomb. We might have pictures of other various things in Christianity, but the Ark of the Covenant really doesn't say anything to us as Christians. We look at it as an old Jewish piece of furniture that was in the tabernacle or the temple. But I want to show you that um, I think not only was it a piece of furniture, but that it represented something much bigger than itself, and that if we can get to the bottom of it today... It represents something for Christians now. And so I want to minister tonight. If I was going to title it, I would say out with the old and in with the new. And that's kind of a theme I want to use a little bit this weekend is that we, we're moving away from what was and we're moving into what is new. And from a practical standpoint, let me not be theological for a minute, okay? Just let me be practical. From a practical standpoint, I think that we need to be more forward thinking than, re, than, than reverse thinking. In other words... It's great to remember the past, what you did when you were a kid, how things were when you were first married, what you did when you raised your children, or for those who still have a lot of that stuff out in front of them, we still have our yesterdays no matter what. That's great to have. That's why we have family photo albums. It's why we have family reunions. We think back. We can't live there. And so we have to be forward thinking people in that what's tomorrow bring and then let our yesterdays inform our tomorrows. So in a lot of ways, from a non-theological standpoint, I think out with the old, in with the new is part of actually living. You get rid of the old and you bring in the new. You throw out the trash and you buy new stuff, right? And that's just practical, but it's also personal and interpersonal. And so understanding what to leave behind is important. And it's that way in Christianity too, while still holding on to the things that matter. And so there are things that matter. We call those tradition. There are things that matter that are part of our heritage if we throw too many of them out, we don't have anything to lean on when times get tough. And I've seen some people who deconstruct their faith to the point that they get rid of everything. You get rid of church, you get rid of reading your Bible, you get rid of discipline, you get rid of giving. Oh, I'm still saved. I'm, I'm the righteous of God in Christ. And they're right. They are God's righteous. But we get rid of so much stuff and then tragedy hits. And there's no church family to lean back on or they don't have a prayer life, or they need a scripture and they don't know it. They don't know their Bible. And that stuff doesn't just happen. You don't just accidentally know texts. You don't just, you don't just suddenly have a prayer life. You discipline it, you cultivate it. So there's a fine line between out with the old, meaning everything in your life, get rid of, and in with the new, meaning if it's fun and spectacular and it's shiny, grab it. There's a fine line, and I think we need the Holy Spirit to teach us that. And we need to lean into the people around us instead of pushing people away from us. And so that's one of the things that church is important for. And it's one of the things that we have as our, in our Christian heritage. Um, before I read any text tonight, I, I want to I say this because I think this is vital. And it's something that Paul White has to remind himself of over and over again. And if, and if I need it, maybe somebody else does too. Um, we've been in some respects in the church for generations been taught that we have a job and that is to go out and change the world for Christ and help people live better. And so when we come to church, we feel like it's our job to help people change. And I just want to, I'm, this is why I say this to me first and then to you. So to me, I always remind myself of this. I can't change your life tonight. I can't make you do anything. 
I can't make you believe anything. I can't even convince you of anything. It's not my job. It's not Tabernacle of Hope's job to change this city. What it is our job to do is just pull the, res- pull the grave clothes off of the people that God brings us because everybody's got junk. They got guilt, shame, fear, condemnation, anxiety. We're not here to put more on you. We're here to take as much of it off as we can. So I don't want to, I'm not trying tonight to overturn anything. I'm not trying to change your world. I'm not trying to set you up theologically to give you some great lofty thought. I just want to try to put one little seed in your heart. Pull one little strip of grave clothes off your life. Make your life just a little bit eased tonight. I didn't say change you. I can't do that. But I could help pick the load up a little bit and help you see a little clearer. Make, maybe make God look a little shinier. Maybe make Jesus look a little loving, more loving. Maybe, maybe you leave. And, and listen, if a church needs a goal and this is what we want to be in our community, let's be a place where people come and they go, you know, when I leave, I just feel a little better. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Because for so long we thought, oh, you go to church, man. You're supposed to come out feeling like you got under conviction and beat up by the Holy Ghost. And man, you're already getting beat up out in the world. So you come in here, just relax. Let's ease into the presence of the Lord for a few days and just enjoy who, he, who and what he is. Let me show you a scripture that actually speaks to what I'm talking about in regards to the old and the new. And it's from Hebrews chapter 8, and I want to read the very last verse of Hebrews chapter 8. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now, I want you to notice the quote marks at the beginning of the word a, in that he says, a new covenant, because this is actually a pull from the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah tells us that there's a day coming when God's going to bring a new covenant to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, for purposes of this, and I'm not trying to bog us down, slow down, but I just want to say this up front. For purposes of Christian teaching, we've got to understand that God has viewed his people through the lens of Jesus, not through the lens of race or geography so he, is not, he doesn't have a people on the earth that have a certain skin color. He doesn't have a, a, a people on the earth that live in a certain part of the world. And if we don't get that clear, then we're not under the new covenant. Because if we think that God does have a people with a skin tone and a geography, then God has Israel. Yes. And you don't have a new covenant. Yes. But Israel does. Right. But you don't. So we might as well stop talking about covenant. So I think one of the baseline things we need to get back to in the church is realizing that God doesn't have special people. There's a rousing round of endorsements. So I'll try it again. God doesn't have a people he prefers over other people. All right. And, and, And I don't care about race, skin tone, money, flags flying, where you live on the planet. God's not a racist. God's not a sexist. God, is, God uh, isn't, isn't frightened by people. God isn't turned up. So let's get out of the mode of he's got a people and they live on this part of the world. Out of that. Because if we can't get out of that, then this isn't going to matter. Because you don't have a new covenant. So the house of Israel and the house of Judah is an inclusiveness that comes in through Christ. Because where Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. Yes. Okay. Jesus becomes the fulfillment of all the promises. Remember all the promises God made to Israel in your Old Testament? And we read them and go, God said he'd do this. God said he'd do this. God said he'd do this. And then Jesus comes along and God says, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1 and says, all of the promises of God are in Christ and they are yes and they are amen to to his glory. So all the promises God made are not to Israel and they're not to Judah and they're not to people living on the other side of the world. All of God's promises are in Jesus. How many of you are in Jesus? So if you're in Christ, where are God's promises? In you. Okay, now that we've cleared that cloud, we can get down to new covenant business because you're not going to be confused now whenever he says a new covenant and he was talking to Jeremiah and he was talking to Israel you are included in whatever that promise is. Okay, so he says a new covenant by making a new one, he made the first one obsolete. I don't know how much plainer the word obsolete can be, but I'm going to try. Obsolete means that whatever is obsolete has been rendered absolutely ineffective and out of bounds. It doesn't count anymore. 
if you have, uh, it, in regards to technology, you might go out here and ride a bicycle, you might go out here and ride a car, you might go out here and ride an airplane, or a boat, or a submarine, or a rocket ship to the moon. But there are some modes of transportation that have been deemed obsolete for today's highways. Right? right. They used to be big deals. People used to ride chariots and wagons, and they used to do it all the time. That mode of transportation due to our highway system has been rendered obsolete. Does that mean that that chariot doesn't exist anymore? Oh, no, it's out there. Somebody's got it in a barn somewhere. Does that mean that the wagon doesn't exist anymore? Oh, no, it's out there, but it's obsolete for what it used to be used for. And so the author of Hebrews says there was a first covenant, but it's obsolete. So whatever that first covenant said, it doesn't say to you anymore. It's completely obsolete. What is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the new covenant that's been given to us in Christ has completely rendered the old covenant obsolete. Whatever, and, and I don't mean you can throw out everything that's back here in your Bible, but I mean that this isn't how you establish your righteousness. You don't read an Old Testament story and try to figure out how to please God. You don't read an Old Testament story and try to figure out how God's going to move. You want to know what God's going to do and how God's going to respond and how God's going to move? You look at Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise and therefore Jesus becomes the cutting of a new covenant. Now, this is the end verse of the 8th chapter of Hebrews, but it doesn't mean that the author stopped writing. He was continuously writing. He didn't break this into chapters. And the next verse is chapter 9 and verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So I want to try to take you on a little journey the next few services on why the author handles the new covenant this way. Because quite frankly, in our lens, this is a little odd. If I were going to explain to you there, there's a new covenant and there was an old covenant and the old covenant is obsolete, let me introduce you to the new covenant. It doesn't seem like what I should do now is start to show you the physicality of the old covenant, but that's exactly what the author does. And he does it because if you'll notice at the top, this is written to the Hebrews, which means it's written to a people who have Hebrew culture, who understand Judaism, who understand the Torah, and who understand all of the things that have been associated with their religion. And one of the things that's very important for us to get as Christians is that our Christianity has a distinct difference between Christianity and Judaism that is actually very easily illustrated, and it's this. Judaism was a very tangible touch and feel and smell and taste and see religion. You could touch everything associated with it. It had a temple. It had priests. You killed actual animals. You could smell their blood. They waved incense. You ate the meat off the altar. You had gold. You had silver. You had jewels. There, everything was visual, audible, sensory, and then comes the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says he's going to be in you, and then you and I are going to be in the Father. And, and at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enters the church, and all of that tangible stuff starts to be equated with an old way, and all of the invisible stuff starts to be equated with a new way. It's why Paul would write to the Colossians and say, set your affection not on things on the earth, but on things above. Because as a Jew, you set your affections very much on some of the tangibleness of your religion versus this new thing of the Holy Spirit where you're setting your affections on the invisible. And so the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and it had an earthly sanctuary. And so now the author goes, let me show you what was inside the earthly sanctuary. Verse 2, for a tabernacle was prepared for the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. The tabernacle basically has three parts. In some ways, it's a type of the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the tabernacle had an outer courtyard where the, ark, where the brazen altar sat. This is where you killed your sacrifice. And then you came inside of the main room of the tabernacle. And inside that main room was a lampstand, a table of showbread. And this was called the sanctuary. Sometimes in the Old Testament, we called this the holy place. And then read on verse 3. Behind there was a veil. There's a curtain at the back of the tabernacle. And behind that part of the tabernacle is called the holiest of all. Sometimes called the holy of holies. You've heard of this? 
The Holy of Holies is behind the curtain. This is behind the veil. By the way, remember when Jesus dies on the cross and the gospels say the veil in the temple was rent in half from top to bottom when Jesus died? That's the veil. It's the curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place. And when Jesus dies on the cross, they say that the veil in Jerusalem's temple ripped from the top to the bottom which was a symbolic way of saying that there is no longer a separation between what goes on in this room and what goes on in that room. And the reason that's important is because behind that veil is a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. And inside that Ark, and we're going to slow down a minute and start talking about the Ark, but look at this description. Inside the Ark is a golden pot that has manna. That's number one. Aaron's rod that budded. That's number two. And the tablets of the covenant. That's the third. So there are three items inside the Ark of the Covenant according to Hebrews chapter 9. By the way, outside of Hebrews chapter 9, we do not get this in any other scripture in the Bible. The only, everywhere else in the Bible just tells us that the, the Moses law is inside the tabernacle. You get in the Old Testament, it tells you that Moses law is inside the Ark of the Covenant. But Hebrews says at some point they added Aaron's rod that budded. And at some point they added... Uh, uh, the, the pot of manna. One more verse above it, verse 5, above that Ark of the Covenant were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And that sentence right there, of these things we cannot now speak in detail, I'm going to, I don't, just, just humbly, because I'm not on par with whoever wrote Hebrews, but I'm going to jump in here and say, now we get to. Whenever they were writing this letter, they didn't have time to stop and talk about it. So they went, of this stuff we can't speak now in detail. In other words, I'm not going to bother to talk about what was inside the ark. I'm not going to bother to tell you what the ark represented. We are. Okay. They couldn't do it because they didn't have time. They had other stuff to do. We don't have anything else to do. It's Friday night. We don't have anything else to do. We're going to talk about what was inside the ark. We're going to talk about that ark of the covenant. So we're going to take some liberty tonight where Hebrews 9, 5 says we don't have time. And we're going to disagree and say, Yes, we do have time. If we don't get done tonight, we're going to work on it tomorrow night. If we don't get done tomorrow night, we're going to work on it Sunday. The things they couldn't speak about now in detail, we're going to speak about now in detail. So let me make sure we make a connection here. Out with the old and in with the new, something's obsolete, something is new. And this was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, following the resurrection, the writer of Hebrews goes, the old is ready to go. It's, it's vanishing away. The new is here, so we're going to be out with the old and in with the new. And then to describe what the old looked like, they start to describe the tabernacle of Israel with all of its gold, with all of its table of shoe bread, with all of its candles, and with its Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark of the Covenant was first introduced in Exodus 25. And in the 25th chapter of Exodus, it walks through the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. I, just, I don't want to take you to Exodus 25. I just want you to know that so that you can go there on your own and read the 25th chapter of Exodus and look at that ark, but I want to talk to you for a second about what it looked like, okay? Because I actually think that there are some things about the ark that are types and shadows of who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. Because first of all, the ark of the covenant was given to Israel as a representation of the place where God sits on the earth. And so when Israel placed the ark of the covenant behind that big curtain, that room behind the curtain was the only room in the ark that had no light. There was no door, there was no window, and there was no candlestick. So in abject darkness, the ark of the covenant sat all of the time because wherever you are in darkness, God rests his spirit wherever you are in your darkest place. And God wanted Israel to know that whenever you're in your darkest hour, that's where the presence of God sits. I want to remind you that God doesn't wait for you to get to your best for God to show up in your presence. God is in your presence in your absolute worst moment. Don't wait around on your absolute best moment. This is why the church is better served if it's full of people who've been living their life in darkness all week. Let me just remind you that one more time. If you can bring people in who only are used to darkness and they come into the presence, that's the place where God does his great creative work. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God breathed upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. 
Why does that happen that way in the scriptures? Because God does his best work in our chaos. God does his best work in our darkness. Out of the belly of the whale, Jonah comes forth. Out of the midst of the holy of holies, God's presence sits. So whenever they drop the Ark of the Covenant into that room and they pulled the curtain, a cloud by day and a fire by night would settle down in the middle of the wilderness and wherever it settled down was where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to sit because on top of that Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat of God. So what Israel got used to seeing is wherever that Ark is, that's where God lives. Wherever that Ark resides, that's where God resides. And so whatever that Ark is made up of is what God is made up of. And here's the first thing we learned about the Ark. It's covered in gold inside and out. The reason that's essential for our understanding is because it sat inside of a building that was gold on the inside but covered in badger skins on the outside. Let me explain that. The tabernacle, let's imagine this building, this is a little larger. Let's imagine this building is sort of a layout of the tabernacle and perhaps the curtain is right up here about where that stage would be and behind that would be the Ark of the Covenant. That's, ab that's total darkness. Every wall and the floor inside of this room would be gold. It would be wood overlaid with gold. And so the room would jump and sparkle when you lit up the golden candlesticks inside the holy place. It was gorgeous. But on the outside, it was covered in dead animal skins. So that once they put the frame up, they just laid the, the skins stitched together of animals over the outside of the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle, never, the, the writers of the Torah never really explain why. But... I got a feeling it's because inside represents the presence of the holy and outside represents the presence of the natural. And so on the outside, I'm just badger skins. But on the inside is the presence of God. Interestingly, the Ark of the Covenant was gold on both the inside and the outside. Because the Ark of the Covenant was a representation of God, whereas I think the tabernacle was a representation in some ways of Israel. Israel from the outside looking in is nothing special, but on the inside she sparkles. God, both on the outside and the inside, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you realize that you're not the same yesterday, today, and forever? I have some good yesterdays, some bad todays, and hopefully some better forevers. I've had some good yesterdays, some bad todays. I've had some bad yesterdays and some good todays. I'm hope my fingers are crossed for forevers, but I'm not holding my breath because I know me. I'm covered in badger skins. And badger skins like to chew people out once in a while. And badger skins get in bad moods. And badger skins don't say things they'd like to say. Now, on the inside, I'm sparkling, man. On the inside, I know that I am his righteousness and I am what he says that I am, but I'm not always that on the outside. That's also why you can be easy on the church, man. We beat the church up all the time because they don't live up to our expectations and they fail. But the church... The church is just covered in badger skins, man. It's just a bunch of us doing the best that we can. But inside is precious gold. So when we bring people into that image, let's remember that. So the Ark of the Covenant is a representation of God, both gold on the inside and the outside. It had little rings on the corners of the Ark of the Covenant because there were staves that were supposed to go through, pieces of wood that were supposed to go through those, those rings so that the priests could put a, a priest on all four corners of that box and they could grab that box and put it on their shoulders. Um, a little bit like you see pallbearers carry a casket. Keep that in mind, by the way. And they picked that up and they would carry it and they never did it unless the presence of God left. So if the cloud by day and the fire by night got up and moved, they were to go in and pull the curtain and grab the Ark of the Covenant and put it on their shoulders and follow the cloud by day and the fire by night. And wherever the cloud by day and fire by night sat down, they were to put the Ark of the Covenant there. They would build the tabernacle around it because the church is built around the presence of God. The believer is built around the presence of God. What's beautiful about that is that God was transient. God never sat in one spot. By the way... He who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is still transient. God is on the move. This is why we got to get rid of the old and go into the new sometimes. I don't mean you pull up all your roots and burn everything, but I do want you to understand that God is on the move, and where we're not on the move, we're often out of wherever God's at. And that doesn't mean we got to pick our church up and move it to the other side of the street all the time, or we got to run down the road and be in a different building, but it means we can't fall in love with the position that we're in. 
You know, one of the things that I've noticed in the church that I think is something we're going to have to grow up on, uh, grow, out of, grow out of, that's a better way to say that. We get infatuated with how it used to be in the church. My entire life, every church I've ever been in, it, will, it always had a handful of people wanting to tell you how it used to be, how good it was. But you know what? That's not just a church. That's everywhere. Like go in the local coffee house and there's going to be two or three old dudes sitting around the table telling you how good the football team used to be. Tell you how good the country used to be. Tell you how good the state used to be. Tell you how good that steakhouse used to be. Tell you how good that road outside of town used to be. Everything used to be, used to be, used to be. Everything was always better. Everything was always brighter. Everything was always shinier, newer, prettier, better. But we've let that come over into the church where the old time preachers were better preachers. The old time singers were better singers. The old time theology was good time theology. People who did stuff yesterday always did it better than we do it now. Everybody now is influenced by the world. Bunch of sinners looking like the world, acting like the world. Those old timers knew God. And we are so big on that that we, we don't even realize that a lot of times we're just reaching back in the past thinking that it's somehow better. And God has, sta has staves in the ark because the presence of God is always on the move. God never goes, boy, it was really good a generation ago my preachers were hot back then man they knew what they were doing no the presence of God is always moving forward always moving into people's lives never moving backwards and not having to borrow from the past this is why Jesus doesn't heal people the same way twice, particularly with the blindness healings. I've, I've probably brought this up to you before, but it's spectacular to me. Go read the Gospels. When Jesus heals blind people, he never heals blind people the same way two times in a row. And I think it's because no one had ever healed blind people in the history of the world. There was not one recorded healing of a blind person in the Bible until Jesus. And Jesus comes along healing blind people all the time. Sometimes he spits. Sometimes he speaks. Sometimes he touches their eyes. Sometimes he touches his eyes. Sometimes he touches their eyes and it only half works. So he touches their eyes twice. So it works all the way. It's incredible. And so a while back I said, Lord, why is it that Jesus never does it the same way twice? And what I heard in my spirit is because you don't get to predict how I move. I am always moving unique to the individual, not unique to the user. So it's not about what I'm used to, because if I get used to it, I try to duplicate it. It becomes what the Holy Spirit wants. And so one of the reasons the ark was transient was so that Israel would realize that their God's always on the move. So that if it got rough in one spot, you would realize, hey, don't worry about it. God's going to be on the move. We ain't going to stay here forever. And also, if it got really good in one spot, you wouldn't get comfortable and go, boy, we're just going to kick back and relax right here. God go, this isn't the way this works. We're always on the move. And you might say, well, why is that? Why would God be that way? Because we are a people passing through this world. We are a people on our way home. Our nature is transient. Our nature is that we're moving from point A to point B. Not so we don't relax, but so that we realize who we're following. And we're not following a box anymore called the Ark of the Covenant, but we're following the one who sits on the Ark of the Covenant. And so we are still transient. Here's another thing. On top of that box was the mercy seat. What, what our text said a moment ago about uh, that, that on top of that, Behind the veil, there was a, and then there was a golden sentence in the Ark of the Covenant on all sides with gold. An overshadowing were the cherubims of glory. Let me talk to you about that mercy seat for just a moment. The Old Testament calls it the mercy seat that sits on the Ark. Somewhere about a hundred years before, at least a hundred years before Jesus, they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, what we call the Septuagint. You might be shocked to know, this is for people who think that you know, there's only one translation that works. You might be shocked to know that the Bible that Jesus would have read from would not have been the original language Bible. Jesus was already reading an alternate language in his generation. So Jesus was reading the Greek Bible that had been originally written in Hebrew. So don't panic if you're reading one written in English or if you're reading a paraphrased one written by somebody else in English hundreds of years later. So you can relax. Jesus was already reading a translation. Jesus was reading the Greek, uh, the, 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 and, and, and the Greek called the Septuagint. And the reason I bring that up is because when the Septuagint translated the Old Testament, translated what we call the Old Testament, out of Hebrew and into Greek, 
they used the word propitiation instead of the word mercy seat. So they would say that the Ark of the Covenant was covered in gold, had staffs through it so you could carry it, and on top of it sat the propitiation seat. Propitiation is a word that John uses. Remember when he says that Jesus died as the propitiation, not only for our sins, but of the sins of the whole wide world. You know what? Propitiation is a fancy word for satisfied. So you want to know what that seat was? That's the satisfaction seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. God sets down because he's satisfied with this spot. He goes, this is the spot I want to be in for today. Put my seat right here. So they'd set the Ark of the Covenant down and the Holy Spirit would sit down. And on the satisfaction seat, God would rest. I love it that the Greek takes the word mercy and translates it as propitiation because what it's really saying is mercy is God's satisfaction. Yeah. Stay with me here. How many of you know that the Bible says God's mercy endures? See, you already know that. God's mercy endures forever, which means God's satisfaction endures. You got it. Let's start over. Let's try it again. His mercy endures how long? Forever. Yes. Mercy is translated propitiation, which means satisfaction. His satisfaction lasts how long? Forever. So if God is satisfied in Christ, he is not temporarily satisfied in Christ. He is satisfied forever. Yep. His mercy over you endures forever. He is satisfied with you forever. He can't be dissatisfied with you. I didn't mean he... he this, this is where we always get kind of hung up, so I just want to pause here and take care of this. See, I'm a father. Many of you are parents as well. I love my kids. I am satisfied with Lucas and Lauren White. I do not want Lucas White to be somebody else. I do not want Lauren White to be somebody else. I am completely satisfied with who they are. I am not always pleased with how they act. We good with that? Yeah. But I am never less than satisfied with my kids. I'm satisfied with who I got. I don't want to trade them in. I don't want to trade them in. I don't want to trade them. I don't care. I don't care what everybody else's kid does. How they act, how they look, what they do. No, 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 no. I got mine. I'm satisfied. How long? Forever satisfied. I am satisfied forever with my kids. I am not always pleased with how they act, but that's okay. I'm still satisfied with who they are. And I believe many times that they're better than they're acting. And how am I going to get it to come out of them? Maybe if I just told them I was satisfied with them, it'd be a good place to start. Maybe if I said, I'm satisfied with you. I don't need you to change in order for dad to love you. I'm satisfied with you. And I think if we would start to show people the satisfaction of God in Christ for them, maybe we would see some change. Maybe we would see some actions. But you know what? Even if we don't, his satisfaction endures forever. I'm not in this game to see you change. That's what I was praying on the way here tonight. I say, like, God, I'm not coming up here on a Friday and I try to get anybody to change. I don't, what am I going to do? Who am I? I don't try to get you to be different. I want you to know how satisfied the Father is just to know you. And if you can take that out of here, I'm foolish enough to believe that if you actually thought you were satisfied to God, you might live like it. Right. Maybe I'm naive. And you know what? Even if you don't, it doesn't change the, the fact that he's satisfied. Why? Because what sits on top of the Ark of the Covenant is a mercy seat. And what's a mercy seat? It's a propitiation seat. And what's propitiation? Satisfied. And so what is God, what's he setting on? Satisfaction seat. So whenever the Bible says we come to the judgment seat of Christ, don't forget that if Christ is sitting there, he's only able to sit there because he is seated at the Father's right hand and at that judgment seat. At that judgment seat is the mercy seat of Jesus. And only in understanding that are we going to understand what God's mercy really looks like. Let me, let me just a couple more before I move on. And, and, and I'm not going to drag it all night because I've already told you we're going we're to work this for a weekend. All right. So not in any really real hurry to try to cover all the bases. I'm glad I threw that out there and didn't try to preach it all in one night because... Too much good stuff. I'm already having a really good time with it too. Yes. And so there, I'm saying a lot more than I intended yes. to say. So we'll just, we'll just work it over for a few hours. Just won't do it all in one evening. All right. So a couple more. There's cherubims on top. Uh, the cherubim of glory overshadowing, overshadowing the mercy seat. When you see the word cherubim, you're already in the plural. 
Okay, otherwise it would be a cherub. So a cherub would indicate that there's an angel on top of the mercy seat. Cherubim would indicate that there's at least two angels on top of the mercy seat. What we know about those is that according to Exodus 25, when it actually describes what they look like, is it's two golden angels. So it's beaten out of, a, it's, it's, it's literally statues of angels who spread their wings over the mercy seat, the propitiation seat, the satisfaction seat. They spread their wings over that mercy seat and the ends of their wings touch each other, the cherubim facing one another with the mercy seat in between. And the mercy seat is simply just, it, it almost could, could possibly just look like a crown edging around the top of that box. Imagine just a crown, the, the top of that box looking as if it's wearing a hat. And overlooking that are two cherubims whose wings touch one another. And the, the Hebrews had a, 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 a little richer understanding of those spiritual entities than, than kind of than we do. Um, and it's, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not the judge of that. Um, but I'll just try to relate to you what it looked like in the Hebrew vernacular. When the Hebrews talked about an angel, they were talking about a messenger. So if they saw an angel, they were hearing God say something to them. Angels delivered the messages of God. You and I don't wait around to see an angel in order to hear a message from God because we have the internalization of the Holy Spirit. This is why in the Old Testament, whenever God wanted to speak to somebody, he would often send an angel. And so in seeing an angel, they would hear the, they would, and you can say whether that was a real angel, real person, and I'm not here to argue that, but that was the image. A cherub was an, was a angelic being that stayed in the throne room of heaven. Cherubim were plural cherubs, more than one cherub who stayed in the throne of heaven. So for an Israelite, if they saw an angel, it meant God was talking to them. If they saw cherubim, it meant they were in the throne room. Seraphim were, a, were an offshoot of cherub, cherubim in that the seraphim were, would fly constantly about the throne of God offering up worship. And so whenever the, you see a cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant, it means that that's the throne room of God. That's the seat that God sits on. Okay. So the, the cherubim wing touching is an indication you've entered the throne. So we're, we're, we've walked past the holy place and we've went into the most holy place and we've seen the God who is pure both on the outside and the inside. There's no hidden motive with God. Whatever you see on the outside with God is what you get on the inside with God. God's not saying one thing to you and, and then believing another. So if you see God pure on the outside, you see God pure on the inside, vice versa. You see a transient God. You see a God who's on the move all the time because of the staves of the Ark of the Covenant. You see a God who has a mercy seat has a satisfaction seat, has a propitiation seat. You see a God with cherubim, meaning that that's God's throne. And then finally, in Exodus chapter 25, we learn this about the Ark of the Covenant. Moses would walk into that place to hear God speak. Because in Exodus 25, it said God would speak to Moses from between the cherubim. In other words, God's voice emanated out. And where does God's voice emanate out from? It emanates out from the cherubim. What did cherubim mean? Throne room. Where's God speaking from? The throne room. So whatever God says, he, said, he says as king. He says as Lord. Now, why is all of this important? Well, see, the ark came to be associated with death. I'm going to try to wind it down in the next few minutes. The ark came to be associated with death because you couldn't touch it lest you die. But it became associated with death for the enemies because when they took it out in front of the armies, they would, it would be the fall of the opposing army and therefore the fall of the opposition became known as the rest for the people of God. Let me show you Numbers chapter 10. I just want to give you an illustration of how they viewed the Ark of the Covenant. Numbers chapter 10, verse 33. Israel departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days. And the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them for the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. That's an interesting phrase. Look at that last line. The reason that the, that the Ark of the Covenant went out was to find a place to rest. I think this is fascinating. It's not trying to find a place to rest for God. It's trying to find a place to rest for God's people. So God isn't just moving around playing chess with your life. You know, just like, I'm gonna, you're going to do, do it my way. No, God's moving to find a place for rest for you. 
He's moving so that he can put you in the position that you're of your greatest use because you're not at your greatest use when you're worn out. You're not your greatest use when you're stressed out. You're not your greatest use when you're fried. You're at your greatest use when you're rested. In Christ is our rest. So the Ark of the Covenant goes out to search out a resting place for them. 34. Next verse. The cloud of the Lord. Now, here's what I told you a moment ago. Remember the cloud? Cloud by day, fire by night. The cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out from the camp. 35. So it was whenever the ark set out that Moses praised the following. So watch how they think about the ark of the covenant. Rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee from before you. Because when they watched the ark go out, they knew people were going to die. So what they began to equate was wherever the Ark of the Covenant went, the enemy falls, and then this in 36. And when it rested, when the Ark found a place to rest, Moses sings a second song and goes, Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. In other words, stop going out in front and beating our enemies, but God, bring rest into who we are. And so the Ark became associated with the place where the enemy dies and where you and I find rest. And it didn't take long. By the time you get to 2 Samuel 6... David's trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem and he brings it back on a horse cart. I don't know if you remember this story. This is one of those lost stories in the Old Testament that's pretty, pretty valuable. But he tries to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem and he don't know how to do it because he hadn't read the Word. We, we like to think they were all good Bible readers. He hadn't read the Word. He didn't know what he was doing. And so David tries to bring the Ark of the Covenant back and he sticks it on a horse cart. And as they're rolling it into town, it's bouncing around and the cart's flying and the Ark of the Covenant starts bouncing. And there's a young guy named Uzzah that runs over and puts his hand up against the ark to keep him from falling off the cart. And he falls over and dies. And everybody freezes. Can you imagine that scene? And they freak out. And they're so scared they go get David. And David comes out there and goes, all right, I don't know what's going on. Just take the ark and put it in that guy's house and picks the closest house. And they do. And the guy they put it in his house is Obed-Edom. Obed of Edom. Obed of Edom is a Gentile. They go put it in a Gentile's house because if the ark's going to kill people, it needs to kill our enemies. See how they're thinking? If the ark's going to kill people, put it in a Gentile's house. Don't put it in a Jew's house. That's our brother's. Go over there and stick it in Obed-Edom's living room. And they do. They walk it up to Obed-Edom's house, and they slide the ark of the covenant, and they drop it in his front room, and they leave. And you would expect that Obadiah's house all gets cancer and falls over and dies in the next six weeks. But actually what happens is over the course of the next three months, the Bible tells us that favor falls on the house of Obadiah, And David hears about it in the temple, in, the, in his palace. And he goes, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that he didn't fall over and die? Instead, he's being blessed? And David goes, okay, change of rules, change of plans. Let's go get the ark. Let's bring it out here. Let's stick it in a tent, open the tent flap, let everybody show up and, and view it. And everybody that shows up gets a flagon of wine and a loaf of bread. And David throws the biggest party Israel has ever seen. And every person in Israel gets to walk in front of the Ark of the Covenant and look at it for the first time ever. Because remember, it's always been hidden back here in the dark. You remember this? And Israel, everybody walks back. Now, I got to think, first of all, you get a loaf of bread and a flagon of wine. That's why you showed up. All right. Probably what it had nothing to do with the ark. Because everybody's like, they're bringing their kids out too. The kids get a flagon of wine too? You know, you're walking up. Everybody, we, we, I got my eight kids. I get nine flagons of wine, nine loaves of bread. Everybody's getting flagons of wine, loaves of bread. We're getting gallons of wine, loaves of bread. Walking past. Hey kids, look, there's the ark. Look, there's the presence of God. Look, and it's, it's stained with the blood. Because every year on the Day of Atonement, you'd sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant as an atonement to appease God. You'd sprinkle blood. So it's stained with blood, but it's shining in that tent flap. I love it when you get to the book of Acts and Peter shows up at the council in Acts 15 and they go, hey, we got to decide, man. Do Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to really be saved or not? Because I don't know. This was the big debate of the early church. Do Gentiles got to be circumcised or not? I mean, what do you guys think? And Peter stands up and goes, I don't know about the circumcision part, but I can tell you this. They got the same Holy Ghost we got. And then Paul and Barnabas stand up and they start to preach, hey, here's what we've seen God do among the Gentiles. And James, the brother of Jesus, stands up and says, 
I think what's going on on the planet is the tabernacle of David. And I know I'm in the weeds just a little bit here. I'm, trying, I'm, I'm, I'm heading for a landing. There, guys, there was no tabernacle of David in the Bible. David never built a tabernacle. His son Solomon built a temple. There was no tabernacle. You know the closest David got? David went to the house of Obadiah, and he picked up the Ark of the Covenant and he walked it back to Jerusalem and he set it down in a field and he put a tent around it and he opened the tent flap and he gave everybody a loaf of bread and a flagon of wine and let everybody and their brother walk up and look at the Ark. And when James found out that anybody could get saved and receive the Holy Ghost, he went, this feels like that time David let everybody in on the secret of the Ark of the Covenant. Listen, I'm here to tell you what had become associated and thought of only as an instrument of death. Once we begin to realize that his mercy endures forever, becomes an instrument of life for everyone who will take the bread and the wine. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pause right there. Jesus feeds 5,000 with some loaves and some fishes. And the next morning, the crowd shows up for breakfast and Jesus goes, you guys aren't here because of the words I spoke to you. You're here because I filled your bellies. And he goes, I would rather you learn how to eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is cannibalism and vampire talk. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. What are you talking about? And the Bible says everybody left him. <laughs> he lost almost all of his disciples. Because he had changed the game. He had introduced them. Bread and wine were covenant food. And bread and wine, if you eat the bread and wine, and Jesus says, I'm the bread and I'm the wine, I'm the bread and I'm the blood, he's asking you to enter into covenant with him. And it harkens back to that moment when David put the Ark of the Covenant in a tent and let everybody come up and look. And he gave everybody wine and he gave everybody bread. Why? Because it's a sign, a type, and a shadow of the Jesus who would give his body and who would give his blood and who would invite everybody in to the satisfaction seat of the Father. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you're still thinking of it as an instrument of death, time to obsolete out the old. Yes. Yep. Obsolete out the old. Start thinking about the new. You know why David was the apple of God's eye? You ever thought about this? How many of you know the Bible says David was the apple of God's eye? Why was he the apple of God's eye? Because he cheated on his wives? Was he the apple of God's eye because he took another man's wife? Was he the apple of God's eye because he might have committed rape? Was he the apple of God's eye because he killed a man? Was he the apple of God's eye because he was a warrior? Was he the apple of God's eye because he was a prayer guy? Was he the apple of God's eye because he could write good songs? Was he the apple of God's eye because he played the guitar well? Was he the apple of God's eye because he was a poet? He was the apple of God's eye because he was the only person in the Old Testament who tore down the veil and said, everybody that wants to come look, come look, and here's bread and wine to help you out in the party. God's not going to kill you. Come take a look. He loves you. And God went, that's my boy. <laughs> and do you know why they called Jesus the son of David? Oh, I know the genealogy. I know he was in the lineage of David. But they didn't call him the son of Jacob. They didn't call him the son of Isaac. They didn't call him the son of Solomon. They called him the son of David. And it had nothing to do with adulteries and murders. It had to do with, here's the veil terror. Here's the man who rips the separation that we've created between us and God. And Jesus comes and tears it down and goes, that's not what my dad looks like. That's not what my dad sounds like. That's not what my dad loves like. If that's what you think, you don't know my dad. Yeah. <laughs> what was old is ready to vanish away, but what is new is in Christ. It had become death so much that Paul called the Old Covenant the ministry of death written and engraved on stone, yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Right. Because it had, it had become so closely associated with separation that it needed to be canceled out and taken away. Now, I want to close here. I wasn't going to close here, but I've looked at the clock and I've been in the weeds and I've taken you on a ride and we got two more sermons. So we're going to save a bunch of stuff for tomorrow night, but I want to close here. 
This is a fascinating little study in the Hebrew, and you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to get something out of it, all right? When you read your Bible in the English, you're reading words, and we're going to just play Old Testament scholar for a minute, okay? Let's don't worry about the Greek. When you're reading your Bible in the English, you're reading words that were translated. Actually, they were translated out of the Greek Septuagint into English. The Greek Septuagint was translated out of Hebrew. So even your oldest English translations are two languages removed from the source. Okay? Because the Old Testament wasn't written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So if we dig past the English, past the Old Testament Greek, and all the way back to Old Testament Hebrew, which is the language it was originally laid down in, we get words that come out translated different in the English based upon context. For instance, the Hebrew word tiba. Tiba means vessel or boat. A vessel is something that carries something else. The first place we see Tiba in the Bible, where do you think that would be? Noah's Ark. The word ark is from the Hebrew word Tiba. And why? Because he built a boat. And what did he put in the boat? Him, his wife, his kids, their wives, animals, seven of every clean, two of every gun clean, after their kind, male and female, one door, you know the story, all of them go in the Tiba. And the translators recognized that if it's holding that many people, a tiba must be a boat. So they used an old word, an ark. Kind of an old English word that we probably wouldn't use now. You know where it shows up again in the Old Testament? In the early part of the book of Exodus. Whenever Moses is born in Egypt and Pharaoh finds out that a redeemer has been born, and so he orders the death of every Hebrew baby boy born among all of the Hebrew women. And Moses' mother takes him and puts him in a makeshift tiba in the Hebrew. And she puts him on a river and floats him downstream. And the translator saw that word and went, okay, it's got something in it. It's floating on water. Tiba, let's call that an ark. It's interesting. We've got Noah's got a big old boat. We call it an ark. Moses got a little bitty boat. We call it an ark of bulrushes. Remember that in the old English? An ark of bulrushes. So an ark doesn't have anything to do with size. It has to do with what it's designed to do. Carry stuff, right? Yeah. Tiba, carry stuff. So when you see the ark of the covenant, you would think in the Hebrew, it's the Tiba of the covenant because it's carrying something, right? It's going point A to point B. Got to be a Tiba. Doesn't feel like a Tiba. Feels like something else. There's another word. The Hebrew word Aaron. Aaron first pops up at the end of the book of Genesis. Joseph dies. And his family embalms him. And sticks him inside of an Aaron. And picks it up. And carries it out of Egypt. And the translators translate it coffin because an Aaron carries the dead. Which one do you think God authorized the Hebrew writer when he told him in Exodus 25, build an ark, ark of the covenant, build a box and put the law in it and set it behind the veil. You would think, because we call it the Ark of the Covenant, God said, build a Teba. But God said, build an Aaron. In other words, if we had translated the words equally, it's not the Ark of the Covenant, it's the coffin of the covenant. Because the word God used in the Hebrew was not the same word you use for a boat that carries stuff, it's the word you use for a box that carries something dead. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, what is old needs buried. What is new needs alive, needs to be released. Tomorrow night, we are going to take you to another moment of the two cherubim. 
We're going to empty the box. We're going to show you new life in Christ. And we're going to show you what Jesus did with his blood on top of a heavenly Ark of the Covenant, coffin of the covenant. Wherever there's something dead in the Bible, there's about to be a resurrection. Don't ever forget it. God loves peddling in stories about the dead because God loves raising things from the dead. And you can't resurrect what hasn't died. And so God's in the business of making something new out of everything. So tomorrow night, we're going to see those cherubim. We're going to take a look in between their wings. We're going to live on with that. And by Sunday morning, we're going to sneak a peek inside that ark, and we're going to see what in the world is in there and why it matters to us. This is going to be a good weekend. We're going to have some fun. That's good stuff. That's good enough. Let's pray. I want to just pray and ask the Father to do some work tonight. Whatever you have tonight that's old and needs let go of, let's go out with the old and in with the new, all right? Some things you're going to have to hold on to because it's part of your heritage and your tradition, but there might be some things the Holy Spirit starts to reveal to you tonight that says it's time to let this go, okay? And I'm, Paul White's not going to give you a list, but I think the Holy Spirit knows how. Father, I have no idea what you want to say to your people tonight, but I know what you've been saying to me. There's some things that are just supposed to stay in the past. They're supposed to be memories that I smile at. There's other things I'm supposed to let go of. Help me to be out with the old and in with the new. Help me, Father, to understand the power of the first covenant is obsolete so that the second can live. Tonight, we've tried to give visual illustration to that first covenant by looking at the ark. And Father, you know better than I do where this needs to go the next two nights. I pray your direction as we take this group there. But every person here that's praying right now, they have the same Holy Spirit Jesus had. And so, Father, they can listen and do exactly as you tell them to do. And I pray that wherever they need to let go of something that is old and pick up something that is new, you will show them. I don't need to show them. I don't know how to show them, but you do. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.